And as they stood on the stage here and gave us their testimonies rapid fire, we were in tears at the breadth and depth and all consuming, comprehensive love of God that meets everyone wherever they're at and touches them in their deepest need. And we just saw something so beautiful last weekend and it was absolutely amazing. And maybe you are new with us this morning. Maybe you're searching for Jesus. Maybe you've recognized you have a void in your heart. Maybe you, someone invited you or you wandered it off the street because you passed that building with the palm trees and the glass front way too many times. We want to welcome you. Can we give our guests a huge round of applause? We love you. We're so glad that you're here. And we'd love to get to know you better. And so the way that you can do that to connect, to become a part of the family here is to say hi at the Yes Bar on the way out or approach one of our hosts. We'd love to give you a coffee or a drink of your preference, answer any questions you might have. There are QR codes on seats and all over the place that you can scan to get more information or even to submit your details so we can be in touch with you. But we just pray that this morning something shifts in your heart, that you connect with Jesus, you connect with someone. Uh, because he's a living God and the church is alive and well. Amen. Well, why don't you spin around, high five somebody, grab a seat as you do that. Amen. (laughs) Incredible. Well, we've had... I've, I've just been receiving text messages all week from church family, baby born yesterday, I'm doing a wedding this afternoon, I've heard about engagements, it's all happening. How fun is church life and church family? It's a precious thing to be a part of. Last night we celebrated my daughter's 18th birthday, which was amazing. And... Um, You know it's a Christian 18th when it's a dry 18th and it's a prayer time, you know, and everyone's putting their hands, laying hands and prophesying over the the birthday person. And as I looked around and I saw all the people who were dear to her praying over her, I was just so grateful for church family because literally every single one of them were church family. And the stories they can tell from her birth right through to now, I'm grateful that I planted my family in the house of God. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And her life is so rich because of that. And so we want to invite you to do the same. I, from my experience, implore you to do the same, to plant your family in the family of God. And uh, so next weekend, we, next Saturday, we have a family social at Captain Cook Park. I think that's what it's called down in Redcliffe. And so if you have, you know, from birth through primary age, children, we just want to invite you to come along and build relationships, connect with other families, build those relationships where society is so virtual and so disconnected and so busy. I want to encourage you to make time for these relationships and plant your children with other children of like-minded families and do this journey together. Your life will be richer for it. Imagine who do you want to be at your son's or your daughter's 18th birthday party and decide that now and plant your child in those relationships now. Amen. So I want to invite you along to that and we want to just put a call out for the kids ministry. If you have a heart for children, if you want to support the children downstairs, we run programs in both our morning services, 8.30 and 10.30. And our beautiful Lydia is leading that and she's just doing a phenomenal job. I want to tell you that the programs down there are comprehensive. They lay amazing foundations and um, there's so much love and prayer and planning that goes into that. And we just want to invite you to be a part of sowing into that precious, precious age group. The foundations that you lay there hold them for good. And um, it's probably one of the most unglorified roles in the church on this side of eternity. 
On the other side, I want to tell you, I reckon you'll have the biggest mansions and the biggest, you know, jewels in your crown because of the foundations that are laid in precious lives that are immovable. So we want to invite you to join the team. I don't really know how to do that. Maybe you should just go to the concierge desk. That's a great place to go and say, you know what? The Lord is stirring me to sow my time into the kids ministry. You can do it fortnightly. You can do just the 8.30 services or the 10.30, or you can be epic and like amazing and do every Sunday both services and we wouldn't say no. That would be awesome. And um, what we're going to do now, we actually just quickly before we get into the stage, I just want to welcome Pastor Dave Connett, who's with us this morning, who will be bringing the word in just a moment. Dave and Beck flew up for Myers 18th, which was just, you know, who great friends, amazing. And um, so Dave will bring the word in a moment. But before he does, we're going to come around a time of giving this morning. And so if you want to prepare your hearts to give, the ways to give will be on the screen behind me. And I want to encourage us out of Hebrews 12, coming out of Easter, the weekend after Easter, Hebrews 12 tells us, Hebrews 12 2 says that we looking unto Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despising the shame is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him, he endured. I'm sure that none of us, including Jesus, would look at a cross and go, that looks like so much fun. But it says there, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What that means is when he looked at the cross, he didn't see the cross, he saw you. When he looked at the cross, he saw me. And so for that reason, he went to the cross. And isn't it true? And don't we have to remind ourselves in a generation that wants like microwave results and in a generation that feels like I'm entitled to a whole bunch of things, that sometimes we need to recognize that doing the hard thing reaps a harvest? And that for the joy set before us, we do the hard things. And so for the joy set before Him, He sowed His life as a sacrifice. And we do it also with our time and talent and treasure. I want to tell you, we should never be thinking, how much do I have to give up? But actually, what am I becoming? And what's down the track? What's on the other side of this thing I'm about to do? And so deciding in our hearts every week when when our pay comes in you know for the joy set before me I'm going to sow a tithe I'm going to give to this person I'm going to be generous for the joy set before me I'm going to serve I'm going to lay my life down I'm going to do those things because I want to tell you our sowing never leaves our lives It's not like you sow it and it ends. It actually turns up in your future, multiplied. It never leaves your life. But as long as you hang on to it, it'll be all it can ever be. But you sow it into the things of God, the synergy and the Spirit of God multiplies it and grows it. It turns up in your future. Pressed down, shaken together, running out all over in the future. For the joy set before us, we sow today. For the joy set before us, we live generous lives. For the joy set before us, we give of ourselves. And so when we're being generous, when we're sowing, do you know what we're believing for? I'm believing for my children to be mighty men and women of God. I'm believing for souls every single Sunday. I'm believing for those souls to become disciples. I'm believing that for the joy set before me as I lay my life down and pour my life out, generations will be shifted and changed to the glory of God. I'm believing that heaven will invade earth as the Lord desires it too. For the joy set before me, I say yes every day of the week. And so as we come around our giving today, let's remember that vision. Let's set our eyes on on that vision. The author and finisher of our faith did it for us and we follow his example. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for an opportunity to partner with you in kingdom, kingdom principles, kingdom standards, Lord God, for an opportunity to partner with you to bring heaven to earth. And Father God, as we give our time, our talent, our treasure, as we sow of our tithes and offerings this morning, 
Father, I thank you that you always breathe upon it. Lord God, when it touches your hands, Lord God, you do mighty things. And what was once just an earthly thing like finance, it becomes someone's soul, someone's eternity, someone's answer, someone's transformation, someone's rescue. And so for the joy set before us, Lord God, we endure and we give of ourselves the way Jesus did for us. I pray your blessing, Lord God, on this offering and everyone who gives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. As those buckets are going around, we have a beautiful video from our global senior pastor that I'd love you to watch. Let's have a look at that. Hey girls, hey church, SWB 2024. I am so excited about this year and I would encourage you to come along and invite your sister, your auntie, your mum, your grandma, your friends, because uh, this topic this year, Revive, is something I believe that we all need. Um, to be revived is to be able to give you the strength to breathe and to move forward into your future with vitality and energy. I'm so excited about our speakers that we have, Leanne Matisius from Awaken Church, San Diego, and Gillian Birchall from the UK. You are going to love these ladies. They have a message that will be in season and be timely. So bring your friends, bring your family, and I'll see you there. So first weekend in May, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, just three night sessions and an afternoon session, which is limited numbers for leaders and team. And so we just want to invite you to grab your ticket and also in faith, grab, grab a ticket for someone else. I'd love to see this, the um, Red Cliff Regos come in at least two at a time, where a woman is buying for herself and in faith for someone else. And uh, so I just want to invite you to make sure that you do that and um, come in faith, the, the, the theme revive. Isn't that something we all need all the time to be revived for revival? And it all starts in the church. Amen? Amen. Well, this morning, we are so privileged to have a longtime friend of mine, Dave Connett, in the house. And um, Dave and Bex have been beautiful friends for more than 20 years and um, amazing. He is a father of three three boys, grown men, I should say, and uh, the oldest got married last year, and um, they're expecting their first baby. Dave Connett is going to be a grandfather. What on earth? Oh, my goodness. And uh, they, uh, Dave and Bex run an incredible church in Newcastle and in the um, surrounds of Newcastle as well called Good Life. If you're ever in the area, make sure you check them out. And I'd love it if we could stand to our feet and honor this amazing, integrous man of longevity to the platform as he brings the Word of God. Uh, all right, lift your hands before heaven. Father, today I thank you that you love and you know every single person. God, your word says that you know the hairs on our head, which is an easy count for some. But God, today, I thank you that you know the thoughts and the intents of every heart also. And so today, we don't just want to hear a message. We want to become the message. We want to grow stronger, more faith-filled, and more able to take the gospel from our hearts to the world that so desperately needs it. Lord God, fill this place with your power and your might in Jesus' name. And some with faith shouted. Amen. Before you take a seat, before you take a seat, look to the left, look to the right. Are you happy? Are you happy with your choice? It's not too late to make a quick little shift. You know what I mean? If you're good, you can take a seat. We are some big decisions on the front row here. That was big. It's big. Really appreciate that. Um, well, look, it's great. It's great to be in Redcliffe. And uh, Jared and Kay, how much fun is it hanging with you guys? Thank you so much uh, for being absolute legend humans and for your leadership, uh, not just of this church, but in the kingdom of God. Thank you so much. You're past the legend. Aren't they absolute brilliant people? Brilliant people. 
not just good looking, some would say professionally good looking. And so we want to appreciate you for that as well. Um, it's so great to be here. Yes, I'm about to become a grandfather uh, in 11 weeks. And I know you're thinking, he's not that old. Just, and you're right, I'm not, I'm not. Um, and um, so we're just trying to work out what the grandparent name is going to be. So there's a couple of options, and I'm not going to go normal. I'm not just going average every day. It's not going to be granddad. It's not going to be poppy. I'm thinking when the kids, when the grandkids get to school, primary school, what they're going to do is they're going to be saying to their friends, friends are going to say, what are you up to for the weekend? And they're going to say, I'm heading to my place. Wouldn't it be great if a child at age seven could tell his friends, I'm going to Desblade's house? Optimus Prime, maybe. Like, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I'm, thinking I'm going to be Optimus Prime. That's going to be my grandparent name. And my son, my, my 21-year-old son, who's uh, who had a honeymoon baby, and you can see the whites of his eyes. He is, he's, he's, it's hitting him hard right now. This young fella, Sam's a great man, isn't he, Isaiah? He's a good bloke, but uh, you can see the whites of his eyes right now. And uh, it's a good thing there's some family around. They'll be great. They'll be absolutely fantastic parents. But my son's like, Dad. I'm not going to let my kid call you Optimus Prime. I said I was a youth pastor for so many years. You don't think I'm good at shaping the minds of young people? <laughs> excellent, Smithers. Excellent. That's, what, that's, that's where we're going right there. It's going to be absolutely fun. Um, so, um, look, we're going we're to get right into it. So, um, we were here for a birthday party last night. And um, I look, at Maya, last night there was time. It was, it was a dry wedding. A dry wedding. It was, it was no wedding. My, I was at a wedding last September. Anyway, it was a, it was a <laughs> it was a dry birthday party, a dry 18th, and people prophesying. But I felt um, last night God gave me like a snippet, and everyone else was so long and so super spiritual. I thought that's just not enough. It's absolutely not enough. And as I prayed since then, I felt God wanted to let you know uh, that the good work, the Scripture says, the good work that He started, He's faithful to complete. And that that is going to be like a header over your life. The good work that he started. People are going to go, wow, look how far you've come. And you'll know, and those around you will know, it's just the good work that he started. At every season, there is more and there's growth. There's capacity for you, not just in uh, the supernatural, but in the natural as well. Uh, team building, leadership. It's not just leadership that you will have for position, but you will lift. You'll be like a tide that lifts boats around you. And so the good work that he started, Started, he's going to be faithful to complete. It's the word for you now, but it's the word for you tomorrow. And it's the word in every season of your life. There's more, there's more resources, the more grace of God for your life. Young lady, you are a champion. Nice, fantastic. Stop bullying your brothers and sisters. That was, that was a joke, but seriously. Anyway, hey, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter five. We're going to get straight into it. This is the first time I have preached at City Point Redcliffe uh, where the family's here in a very long time. First time. Um, it seems like every year, like um, I, I'm, I'm around about Schoolies Week. I come up for New South Wales Schoolies Week. It's the second week and it, it's the forgotten week of Schoolies Week. And so all our Novocastrians, all our Newcastle gang come up for Schoolies Week at the Gold Coast. And uh, I'm like, I'm around. Do you want me to preach? They're like, yeah, sure. Come and preach. And then the family exits. They go away, and I'm not quite sure if it's because they go, I don't want to stick around for this. Or they're thinking, we really trust him. I'm really not quite sure. But um, so we've been praying. We've been praying for salvation in the family, especially Pastor Carolina. Today is the day I see that hand. Is there another? But we're good to be here, right here at City Point Redcliffe, the greatest church you could be a part of. All right, Luke chapter 5, verse 18. If you've got it, say, I got it. If you haven't got it, say, give me more time. And you need, yeah, that's a slow one anyway. Luke chapter 5, verse 18. If you haven't got your Bible with you, it'll appear on the big novelty one behind me. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. If you're reading the New King James Version, it says they carried a lame man. That's the name we give to my 15-year-old son, Joel, because he tells terrible jokes. But this guy didn't tell terrible jokes. His legs didn't work. And so they came carrying him on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof. They lowered him on his mat. 
through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus when Jesus saw their faith. Everyone say their faith. We will be getting back to that, don't you worry. He said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they were in the meeting right there. They began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and he asked, why are you thinking that? It's amazing, sometimes my wife asks me the question. She says, what are you thinking? And I have a problem with that because sometimes... It's really weird up in here. And, and how many times, husbands, you say when your wife says, what are you thinking? You say nothing. And it's not nothing. It's just you were thinking about the Roman Empire. You were thinking about, oh, so, uh, you, look, you were off with the fairies and you want to say nothing because really it's kind of nothing, but you're really off in a weird, weird place. My wife says, what are you thinking? And sometimes I don't want to say it because it's actually stupid. That would be terrible. She's going to be, and then, she, then we're going to have a third degree about why were you thinking that? I don't, I, don't, I, don't want to, I don't want the conversation. I don't want to go there. But sometimes, ladies, your husband has a nothing box. He goes to the nothing box and he just dwells in the nothing box. It's a rarity. And so he's allowed to say at that point, I was thinking nothing because it does happen occasionally for a man, but mostly he's just thinking stupid stuff. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So Jesus wouldn't ask me what I'm thinking. He just knows what I'm thinking, which is kind of strange because I don't have ducks in a row. I have squirrels at a rave. And so Jesus would just, I reckon Jesus would be watching on if I was in the meeting. He'd just be laughing. I reckon he'd be like, oh, that was a funny one, Dave. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he got up, but he went walking and leaping and praising God, walking and leaping. Come on, do you know the song? Do you know the hands up? Those that know the song, please sing along with me. In the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, you, you sound, that was, uh, Jared, you're sacked. You're sacked. It's all over. Not required, redundant, anyway. Everyone was amazed, gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. I love this because if we're talking about the, the theme of the gospel, what you want is for the good things that are happening inside the four walls of the church to not be contained anymore by those four walls. We want the gospel to get out. It's the truth and it's the power of Jesus Christ. And so in this case, what happened is these guys were desperate to bring that one guy into the house where Jesus was. I love this because evidently we don't know their name. Four guys, four randoms, four people that knew how to find the house where Jesus was. They'd already, so it was obvious to me, they were already invested they already were a part of it. No one had to stop. Back in the day, you'd have to stop and consult your refidex, right? And people say these days, you can't hold your phone while driving. I'm not, I'm not condoning it, not condoning it at all, but you're not allowed to hold your phone while you're driving. Back in the day, we used to have that refidex and turning the pages and on the lap and trying to get, I was, I'm a South Side Brisbane boy from back in the day. The North Side to me is an enigma. Where goes to where? I have no idea. And really, I don't care. As long as I can get to Redcliffe and then through to the beaches of the Sunshine Coast, I'm a happy camper. It's all I need. That's a good, that's a good faith in Jesus' name. And, and so they're not stopping to ask directions. They, they know where the house of God is and we don't know their name. So they're obviously not disciples. Or while they're up on the roof, someone would have said, oh, Thomas, Bartholomew, what are you guys doing up there? Jesus would have said, hey, check my disciples and check their faith. But they were sitting up there and we don't even, they don't even get into the room. This is a wild situation. At least one of them. It proves to me that they're not disciples, but they knew the house of God and they were invested. They had relationship and they knew how to find it. It also proves to me that something happened with those four people when that went outside the four walls of the church. At least one of them had relationship with someone with a desperate need. And there was enough relationship that when he comes to them and says, you, my friend, need to come to my church. 
that it was a church that he knew he could invite people to. Well, I think you're in a good space because it seems like you're in a church like that as well. What a convenient escapade for you right here and right now at City Point Redcliffe. It's a remarkable church to be a part of. Is there perfection? No, but you don't bring perfection either, so don't expect it. If you find the perfect church, don't wreck it by attending. That'd be terrible. I love it. Someone said to me recently at church, they said to me at the end, they went, oh, I didn't really like worship this morning. I said, well, that's good because it wasn't for you. It wasn't about you. We weren't worshiping you. It was for you to join in to. At least one of these guys understood Jesus' words of follow me, I'll make you fishers of men because they'd had a relationship. The whole thought is that what we do is we take what God is doing inside the four walls of the church and by relationship, example, and invitation. So we want to do all three of those. You want to, do, you want to build relationships with people that don't know Jesus on intentional situations. Because what you've got inside of your life is remarkable. What you've got inside of your life, the Lord Jesus Christ, is worth sharing. And so these guys, one of them, at least one of them went out and built a relationship with this one guy who desperately has need. And so the generosity moment we're talking about earlier, I'm thinking that's exactly right. The generosity that you practice with your tithes and offerings inside the four walls of the church is to set you up for generosity that spreads outside the four walls of the church. So one guy's got generosity, he's got relationship and he goes to the guy, he says, you should come to church. And he goes, how? He goes, I don't know, we'll work it out. He goes back and he's got relationship with three other guys. They don't get inside the church building. So this relationship that happened inside the four walls of the church continued on the outside of the four walls of the church. And now he's got a posse. He's got a gang. He's got a tribe. He's got a connect group. I don't care what you call it. But these guys knew each other and supported each other. And the three guys are like, you want a what? And he goes, well... You know, that lame guy, not the guy with bad jokes, but the guy whose legs don't work. All it is, we want to get him to church. How are you going to do that? Well, now you lads are the muscle. So they come along and they head to this guy, four guys, maybe they only know one, but at least one. And they say, we'd like to get you to the house where Jesus is. And so he goes, how are you going to do that? They said, we're the muscle. They get him on a mat, one on each corner and along they go. There was a teamwork that started inside the four walls of the church that continued on the outside of the four walls of the church that led to one person coming to the house of God. This is a remarkable deal and it's the power of the gospel. I came to church for all the wrong reasons as a 16 year old. I came because a girl invited me, a little thing we call flirt to convert and I got done hook, line and sinker. When I got there, I was arrested by the love of Jesus Christ that came through that example of brilliant and generous people. I came, a girl at school said, you want to come to my youth group? And I thought, darling, if you are going to youth group, I will also be in attendance. (laughs) Very happy to praise the Lord. So I went along. And I don't know if you remember the first day. I don't know if you remember where God found you. But everyone comes on a mat. Everyone comes carried by someone. Oh, I, was, I mean, I've got three lads that have grown up in the church. It's all I've ever known as being a pastor's kid. They didn't come on their own. We brought them along. We raised them in the house of God. Everyone starts somewhere. And if you remember where God found you, it'll start to rattle the cage of how comfortable sometimes we get in the inside of the four walls of the church. And remember that if I got carried in, there's a next season now of being ones that carry other people in. My comfort in the house of God is fantastic until it becomes too comfortable. When I want to open up the arms and I want to open up the doors and I want to roll out the red carpet. I didn't start carrying and no one ever does. I came in being carried from other people. There's a tension then when we start to face it. There's a tension of inside the four walls of the church and outside the four walls of the church. 
There's a tension of all of the different tensions of time and energy and how am I going to do it and how are we going to make all this happen? But it's a tension worth working through. It's a tension to work out. How do I have my faith that's grown on the inside of the four walls of the church with relationship and with community and encouragement and generosity? And how do we as a team take it outside the four walls of the church that truly is the power of the gospel? And if you will struggle with this, if you'll give it your best shot, there are some rules that are going to work on your behalf. And today I want to let you know about four rules. And if I run out of time, it's going to be three. You'll just have to forgive me. Yep, okay, sure. So these are rules that happen. And when I say rules, I'm not saying, well, Pastor K is now putting down the rules of this is what's going to happen here at City Point Redcliffe. This is not from your global senior pastors, Mark and Lee Ramsey, who are some of the coolest humans on the planet. But these are the kind of rules, like the rules that get enforced upon me in my home by my wife. There is a law around the use of a toilet seat in my home. The law of the use of the toilet seat is the deal of when you have concluded your business, whatever it may be, whatever the number, what you do is you put both seats down. Hands up those that have a both seats down policy rule in the house. All I've found out, go along with that rule, happy wife, happy life. For others, there's different rules. For those, there's no rules. All I know is that we are following the rules of one Rebecca Connett. And when we do that, we are happy. And when we don't do that, there is a lack of happiness. It affects the culture, affects the atmosphere of the whole house. It's like the rule of eating biscuits. I don't know if you know about the biscuit eating rules that happen. Number one rule of biscuits, if you open a packet of biscuits, hoping to eat two of those biscuits, and then as you open up the packet of biscuits, there's one broken biscuit, it's yours for free. Here's the other one, is if you open up the packet of biscuits to put inside the Bicky barrel and there's three left over, yours. Don't have to put it on my, my, my fitness app. No calorie counting on those. Here's the other one you need to know, is if you eat a biscuit in the house of the Lord, the calories don't count. It's the rules of biscuits that happen. Now, the first rule you've got to understand if we're going to go with the tension of taking the gospel outside the four walls of the church, number one is the rule of connection. It's the relationships you build and the wins that are shared. These three guys got together with the one ringleader. I'm so glad that I was carried into the house of God, and I hope that you still remember that and don't take it for granted. But I love it that these guys, what they did is they worked together. Their relationships got stronger as they served God together. If you're wondering where the connection is in church, you've just found it. If you've found where the camaraderie is in church, you might have found that your season changed and your service changed with it. It's an easy thing to do, but also an easy thing to rectify. These guys had relationship outside, but what they did is they served together. I was the young adults pastor at City Point Carindale, well before it was named that, in a previous millennium. Yes, that's true. Black and white, and it wasn't just the TVs that were black and white. Every life was black and white. We had to walk 15 miles to the bus, and that was just to the, it was only a horse with 17 kids on it. But it was back in the 90s, and I was the young adults pastor at Carindale, and what happened is we were in an environment of faith under our senior pastor, Dave and Trish McDonald. There was an environment of faith, and in that environment of faith, and that every lost person matters to God, so let's get busy and let's get at it, There were so many programs, a million programs. We did so many things, potentially not many of them brilliantly. We worked so hard. Everyone that's lost mattered to God. And so we went at it. And so what became Red Frogs happened in the environment with a youth and a young adults department and a communities department that just went, let's go for it. And so... The things that became Red Frogs, the skating and the unis and the schoolies was just people going, let's give it a red hot dip. But that doesn't happen without an environment of leadership that creates room for it. 
ladies and gentlemen, if you're a part of the fabric, if you're a part of the culture, if you're part of the team here at City Point Redcliffe, you want to either A, roll with that culture of faith that all things are possible and that every lost person matters to Jesus or be a leader on team that bigs that up so much. You want to create an environment and in that kind of an environment where you would serve inside and outside the four walls of the church, the relationships that you build will be lifelong. Still got one of them right here. They are lifelong friendships. My friendships, you have no idea how difficult it was in the late 90s to work with Andrew Flipping Goulet. I could have headbutted how many times? Tim Stinking McDonald. Could have headbutted. Absolute diabolical. Simon Campbell. But I tell you what, even though we headbutted, how many times I could have headbutted Sam Stinking Gunser? Oh my gosh. Not an easy man always to get along with. Opinionated, much strong, much loyal. Oh my gosh. But I tell you what, lifelong friendships that were forged in let's do whatever we can and those connections are the strongest brothers and sisters in Christ that I've ever got. And in that environment of of, of taking the gospel to the streets, the rule of connection happened. And I turned from being one who was carried into the four walls of the church to one who then carried others into the four walls of the church. And my life is changed But I found out it's not just my life that's changed, but it's others along the journey. The law of connection is coming for you, ladies and gentlemen. The greatest relationships, the greatest camaraderie is found in serving God inside and outside the four walls of the church. The second law is the law of provision. He is a provider. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. God, where's my provision? It's usually on the other side of your inconvenience. It's on the other side of your sowing. It's on the other side of the activation of your faith and the teamwork. God provides for those that step out on the water. Here's the third one. It's the rule of entropy. Now, the rule of connection and the rule of provision sounds fantastic, but the rule of entropy is everything goes from a high energy state to a low energy state. Right? Which means the theory of evolution is a dead duck according to a whole bunch of science. You can read up on that later or just send a message to my wife because she's a clever scientist. Anyway, she's clever and she's pretty, so I just do whatever she says. No. <laughs> At least I publicly <laughs> display that. <laughs> Through every tension and every transition of your life, there's a challenge to keep the energy high. Get married? Oh, um, how many people bail? Change in life, season, buy a house, do a reno. And things that were central to your life become on the side. Because church doesn't scream as much. And God, he'll wait for you. The law of entropy means that I've got to continue to put energy in. These are rules that are actually around the way that we do life. And you don't want to mess with them. Like you don't want to mess with the rule of the toilet seat of the content house. It's not something you want to mess with. You don't want to mess with these ones, but you want to understand it and then work with it and continue to put energy in. I can't imagine. Could you imagine the first people that thought up the rules of golf? What a ridiculous game. People have said to me, do you want to play golf? And I said, no, I've got other things to do. Like watch paint dry. Grass grow. I don't know. I just, I don't understand. Well, I do understand golf, but I don't understand that anyone would come to it. It was drunk Scottish people that learnt, that made up the rules of golf. Two drunk guys in a Scottish pub. It was made up by Scottish people. They had to be drunk, is just my assumption. And one guy goes to the other, I'm going to think up another game. Oh, what's your game? And he says, oh, what we're going to do is get a ball and we're going to put it in a hole. Oh, like a big basket, like basketball. No. A wee tiny ball. How big's the basket going to be? A wee tiny hole. What are you going to do? You're going to put it in like snooker. No, we're going to give him a stick, a bent stick. They're going to whack it and whack it and whack it and hopefully get it up in the hole. 
It's absolutely crazy. How far? How far is that hole going to be? Oh, it's going to be hundreds of yards away. And they're going to want to try to hit the ball. And they're not going to be able to hit it. So every time they try to hit it, they feel like they're going to die. They're just hitting it and trying to die. I don't want to play this game anymore. It's going to feel like you're having a stroke. So every time you try to hit the ball, you're going to call it a stroke. <laughs> but what we'll do is we'll put it up, a lovely piece of grass right on the end with a flag just to give you some hope. How many times we're going to do it? One or two times? No, 18 times. <laughs> Stupid rules, but the rule of connection will work with you. The rule of provision will work for you. The rule of entropy, you must understand. But the last one is the rule of expansion. These four guys did something remarkable and we didn't even know their names. They didn't get in the building, but their faith made this guy well. The law of expansion means that these guys did something very simple, just had a bit of faith. They worked together. They cared for another human being. They just did their best. And what it meant is they got their name written in the Bible, an account of faith that everyone else could watch on for from now on. 97, we started Red Frogs. And out of the 17 originals, my wife and I are two of them. What I didn't know was where that would take me. Just a couple, a handful of people. Red Frog sounds really fantastic now. Now. Wasn't. It's really weird. We called it first year WWJD at schoolies. How Christian cringe is that? Totally Christian cringe. But my world's expanded. My son, who just got married in September and is having a surprise honeymoon, baby. That's why I'm going to be a granddad. Sorry, Optimus Prime. He met his wife while red frogging. I didn't know in the 90s that that would happen. I didn't know that the pathway to my son finding a brilliant woman of God and starting a family. The stuff from the home that I came from doesn't make sense. That stuff where family functionality gets passed on from generation to generation. I had no idea that that was possible. But stepping out with an attitude of faith to say, I'm not just here to be carried to church, but I'm willing to carry to people to church. Transformed my life and my family tree. And now they get married and now they're creating grandchildren. And this year at Orientation Week, we were short at Newcastle Red Frogs, some froggers. And the old boy put his hand up. He said, I don't know what to do with a bag of frogs. And along I went. And I stood beside my daughter-in-law. It was just popping at the time. And it wasn't until the end of the day I realised that I'm here with my daughter-in-law. I don't deserve any of this. The law of expansion just slapped me in the head. Just by saying yes, here I am standing next to my daughter-in-law who's carrying my grandson while we're all serving Jesus together. Where I came from, I don't want to take for granted. But the way that I don't take it for granted is by understanding that God takes me from one that's being carried to one that takes the opportunity to carry to be a part of a team. And the law of expansion will work for you. Could you imagine the four guys looking down from the top? Looking down. And Jesus saw their faith and says to this guy, your sins are forgiven you. There's the gospel. There's the gospel right there. Pastor Kay, she sounds awesome when she speaks. She always has. One of those people that makes you sick. So maybe you're thinking, I'm not as good as her. So what? Why would you let that stop you? But maybe you become good if you give it a shot. Maybe if overcoming your fears and obstacles to go, God, you know what? There's someone that I could carry. There's someone that I could invite. You don't have to wait for Easter. Next Sunday will be fantastic. 
I mean, after me preaching, it might not be quite as good, but it'll still be. You got this. Come on, let me pray for you. Father, today I thank you for an activation of saints. God, for those that would follow the example of four just good guys, not heroes, we don't know their name, but I pray your supernatural grace on every person. Come on, just where you sit, lift your hands before God. This is a word for this church, for this community. New season of confidence to invite, a new season of confidence to know that God's done something in your life. You got carried and now you're going to take some efforts. I don't know how many guys rejected the offer to come to the house of God, but I do know the one that said yes. And I do know that four guys got their, got their heads together and got their hearts together and worked as a team. So today, this is the coalition of the willing. Father, today, pour out your spirit on these men and women. I pray today an activation, supernatural. Lord God, through every season, Lord God, to put energy and faith into this season, to invite and to connect and to bring people to the house of God. I thank you for a supernatural touch on every person in Jesus' name. You can put your hands down. With every head bowed and every eye closed, a moment of privacy and prayer. If you want to say yes to Jesus, either for the first time or you're coming back to Him, then today would be a great opportunity for you to open your heart to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He loves you, friend. And either for the first time or coming back to Him, today is an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, and a moment of privacy and prayer, it'd be my honour to lead you in a prayer of saying yes to Jesus. And it doesn't matter how many times you come to church, it doesn't matter how long the list of your sins may be, or the size of the individual chunks, God loves you. So if you want to say yes to Jesus, this moment of privacy and prayer, Maybe you pop your hand up high so I can see it. I recognize it. You can pop it back down again. It'd be my greatest honor to lead you in a prayer of saying yes to Jesus. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your bank balance. Color of skin. It's all irrelevant. God loves you. You're his kid. You're his son. You're his daughter. You're accepted in his family. Is there something that's holding you back from connecting with Him? He's already forgiven it, friend. You can't deserve this. No one does. We're all undeserving. And so today, if you want to say yes to the God that forgives every sin and gives you a brand new start, I don't know everyone here, but I know that God knows you. He knows your heart. He knows where you've been. And He forgives and He loves while we yet sin as Christ died for us. And so today, if you want to receive the gift of His love and forgiveness and a brand new start, how about you slip your hand up high? I'm not going to embarrass you, friend. just want to know who I'm praying for. So anyone needs to make that call. I'm going to count to three. This is your chance. One. God's, I tell you what, God must be knocking on the door of your heart because he's, talk, he's knocking on the door of my heart. There's two people here and you're so on the edge. Don't let fear hold you back. Do not. Don't walk out those doors without knowing Jesus in your heart, friend. I don't know everyone here, but I know that God knows you. So if you need to say yes to Jesus, today's the day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you need to do that, I want to pray for you. Two, who needs to make that call? If you're right on the edge, friend, I would encourage you. Your heart knows the way home. Last chance, two and a half, just because I'm nice. Who is it? I'll wait for you, friend. You're important. Three. Well, Father, today, God, I pray supernatural grace to continue to knock on the door of every single heart those that know you those that don't know you those that today are coming back to you God for your spirit to move on our lives to draw us back to you and to empower us to take what you're doing inside of our hearts and inside the four walls of the church and take it to a world that so desperately needs it. So Father, today I pray your grace on this congregation, on every man, woman and child right here, Lord God, that from this point, there's an activation of saints. Lord God, an activation of invitation, an activation of relationship, an activation of faith, Lord God, with those that refused to take for granted the day that they got carried into church. Lord God, I thank you. There's an activation now of those that are called and equipped and sent and confident to do the carrying, to take the gospel to the world and bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for your anointing, your empowerment on every single one in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for having me. Pastor Kay. And thanks, Dave. Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful word. Maybe you didn't get a chance to slip your hand up. You responded in your heart. 
maybe you did raise your hand this morning, we want to encourage you to solidify that decision and that response you made to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life. And so what you can do is just make sure you connect. Keep attending on Sundays. Go a bit deeper. Join a life group. Say hi to someone and ask them questions. We want to meet with you. Maybe you need a Bible. We'd love to give you a Bible. If that's you, you responded in some way this morning. You responded to the invitation of salvation. We'd love for you to make that a solid decision, however you need to do it. You can visit us at the Yes Bar. You can say hi to one of our hosts. I remember making that decision. And actually, do you know, it was the people I came with who discipled me. And so maybe you just need to turn to the person next to you and go, let's do this. Can you help me? Um, And if that person can't help you, just join us. Just connect with us because it's, it's a decision you make individually, but it's a life you live in community. It's a life you live in community with other people. So can we just give those ones a round of applause if you responded this morning? Congratulations. Congratulations. And, uh, and I just also want to invite you, if you'd like to sow into Dave and Beck Connett's ministry, um, I'd love to invite you to go to the concierge desk when you're doing your tithes and your offerings and just say, this much is for Dave and this much is for my regular tithes and my giving. And I encourage you to sow into that good, good soil so we can bless them as they go on their way. Amen. Why don't we stand to our feet this morning? Church, we love you so much. And uh, we're so excited about this week that's ahead. If you have any questions, you want to go deeper in God, you want to connect in a life group, you want to serve, you want to respond to the call for kids ministry, make sure you do that. Become a part of the fabric of this church community. And what Dave has said this morning is so true. It is the story of my life as well. It was in the planting of myself that transformed my generational line. My lineage was completely transformed in the community of church. And in that community, I encountered God. I grew. And now my children have the opportunities I never, ever had. And so I want to encourage you, do something about that this week. Go deeper this week. Don't leave it till next month. Do it this week. Amen? Amen. We're going to go out praising God. Hope to see you tonight in the 5 p.m. service. Ash, you preaching? Cracker. Cracker message. Let's go out praising the Lord.